Thank you very much. Speak your microphone because it's very important. The talk today will be about not consciousness as such. I mean, I will not talk about the subjective experience and, and, uh, and neurocorrelates of, of this, but I will talk about a certain aspect of consciousness, and that is our awareness of the minds of others, what others think, what others feel, what others want, and so on. In the philosophical literature, this is very often called studying the theory of mind, I mean, what we have as a theory of the minds of others. I don't like that term, because in, in general, the, when philosophers deal with it, they, they mainly are concerned with the beliefs and the knowledge of uh, other people. I will talk about a much broader uh, aspect of what I call intersubjectivity. This is a term that's borrowed from, from the more psychological literature. I mean, in particular, Stern has written about different levels of intersubjectivity. What I will do is to put this aspect into a evolutionary uh, setting. And I will also talk a little bit about the de developmental aspect. I mean, how this intersubjectivity develops in, in, in children. I have this cartoon because it, it gives a good illustration what uh, it, it's about. Well, not really because it's, it says, why me, no, and not why you, but anyway. Uh, we have, as human beings, as human uh, beings, a much more developed um, way of, I shouldn't say experiencing the, experiencing the world, but uh, thinking about the world. We can reflect upon uh, our own thinking, we can repl reflect about uh, our own will and, and, and so on. We have what I call self-consciousness. And it turns out that this self-consciousness is very closely related to this intersubjectivity. I mean, understanding what I think about is very uh, closely connected to understanding what you think about. And we don't find the same capacities in other animal species. I mean, I will make some comparison uh, in particular to the uh, primate uh, species. Um, if we look at the development of the brain, uh, I, I want to trace this idea of having some kind of imaginative world, what I will call the inner world. I mean, we have these experiences, these images of, of things not being present and so on. Here I have three mammalian brains. One rather primitive brain of, of a hedgehog, one intermediary of, I think it's a macaque brain, and then a, a human brain. And what I want to focus on is that, and then this is of course the, the, the cortex uh, uh, that is depicted here. And the different colors represent areas of the brain that are used for handling various senses. But what, what I want to fo you to focus on is what's called the secondary areas. I mean, these are areas where the information from the different senses are, uh, is merged into some kind of unified, unified uh, information. Uh, people sometimes talk, talk about cross-modal information because it, it goes across the modalities, the sensory uh, modalities. And as you can see in the hedgehog, the sensory, the uh, uh, secondary areas uh, covers a very small part of the brain. And we see that in, in, the, in the monkey, the, 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 I mean, the, the hedgehog is mainly an olfactory uh, animal. And in, in the monkey, of course, the visual area is very big, and the motor control is, is big because of the hands and, and, and so on. And the second areas are, are beginning to grow in the temporal lobe and the frontal, uh, frontal lobe here. But in particular, what's um, in, interesting here is that in the human brain, the secondary areas are, are dominant in, 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 in the context. Most of our, our cor what is our, our cortex is used for is for merging information. And I think, I mean, we, we know very little about it, but I think that these secondary areas are uh, necessary for this capacity of imagining things, for, for creating this uh, inner, inner world. And I will come back to the correlates between what's go, going on in the brain. I will not talk very much about the brain as such, but I will mainly focus on, on the, uh, what we can know about the capacities of the brain. Um, these secondary areas, uh, they give representations that are cross-modal. We combine, for instance, information about space 
we create our, our, our sensation of the space around us by combining visual information with auditory information with haptic tactile uh, information and, and, and we, can, we can go between the senses that is if you feel something with, with your hands and don't see it you can create an image and you can recognize it by vision when you, when you, when you see it so we can test this cross modality and it's very well developed in humans uh, we find it in some of the other species as well but not as well developed as, uh, as in humans and these cross modal representations then generate what I call the inner world uh, I want to spend some time on, on discussing this a little bit more in detail what I mean by this uh, inner world or sometimes it's called the conscious workspace I mean this is another term from, from, from conscious, uh, consciousness studies um, this is a definition from a, a psychologist at an, uh, an already in the 1940s and his idea, this is Kenneth Craig, uh, is that if the organism not only perceives what's happening in the world but somehow can have a small scale model of the world it can use this model for anticipating what will happen I mean it can use it for planning thinking about what well, if, I, if I do this what will happen then it can make some kind of simulations in the in the inner world so it can think through actions before actually performing them and maybe avoid the most disastrous actions in, in, in this way um, Dennett, the philosopher, speaks about two environments, I mean the outer environment and the inner environment. I prefer the, uh, the term inner world, but it's still it's the same, same concept. So how does, how does this arise and what, what is the content of the, of the inner world? And then I take some ideas from Nicholas Humphrey, a British psychologist who wrote a book in uh, History of the Mind some 15 years ago and um, he distinguishes between what he calls sensations and perceptions and sensations it is this is what your senses give you I mean they, they are the Im immediate impressions but then our brain is interpreting what's the information uh, given to us uh, so perceptions in, in his terminology and in, in my terminology is what is the result of this interpretation let me give you a very simple example here I give you a sensation. This is an incomplete picture. And maybe you have some problems of seeing what's, what this is a picture of. Can anybody help me? What is it? Elephant. It's an elephant, yeah. I mean, uh, when you discover it's an elephant, suddenly the pieces fall together and, and brings, uh, brings out a unified object. Suddenly this becomes a tusk, this is the uh, trunk, and the tail and, 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 and so on the, the pieces fall together and you see it as an elephant so there is a change of your view I mean first you had only saw the black and white blobs and then suddenly it becomes a meaningful pattern it changes it becomes a, a perception because you've been able to interpret this into something meaningful and so the, there is a change in your relation to, to this I mean the, the sensation is exactly the same but you understand, and once you've seen it as an elephant, it's difficult to go back to the pure sensation. I mean, you, you can't help seeing it as an elephant because your brain locks in, in this interpretation. I mean, of course, this is a difficult sensation and that's why, why I show it, and you can see the perception. Then we can go on and talk about, and this is my terminology, this is not from Humphrey. I talk about imaginations. That is, this is when we think about an elephant without seeing anything that is triggered. We can form a picture of an elephant or a horse or anything. We can have mental images. Uh, and, and this is mainly a visual phenomenon. But we can, of course, think about melodies or we can think about tastes or, or, or haptic phenomena and, and, and so on. And I call it, say that they are representations because they are not brought on into us uh, directly from the world but this is created to some extent by the by the brain and my definition of the inner world is simply to say that the total collection of these Im Im imaginations perceptions and imaginations uh, uh, b b build up our our inner inner world now you can make a distinction between what I call cued representation and attached P perceptions are cued because there there is some kind of element in the environment that triggers the representation while if you're imagining something that is not present at all you're thinking about an old memory you're planning for your vacation or something there is nothing